So, we have finally encroached upon the giant India. Some of you have been waiting a long time for this episode. I'm just gonna say straight up, you all know India is incredibly complex and diverse. Even Indians have trouble understanding their own country. Obviously, I won't be able to scratch even the surface in this episode, but I'll try my best. A lot of you Indian geography peeps have helped me along the way, so thank you, and without further ado, let's begin. <laughs> It's time to learn geography now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbie. This place doesn't even need much of an introduction. Everybody has heard of India. It's big, it's loud, it's colorful, and most importantly, it has a plethora of confusing territorial anomalies that I just can't wait to cover. Here we go. <laughs> There's an old saying, India is a place where everyone is in a hurry, but no one is ever on time. First of all, India is located in South Asia, right on the Indian and Arabian Seas and the Bay of Bengal, bordered by six other countries, so close to seven, but that land bridge between Sri Lanka got wiped away like 600 years ago by a cyclone. India is divided into 29 states and seven union territories with the capital New Delhi, which acts as its own administrative unit, located in the capital territory. Keep in mind, New Delhi is actually just the name of one of the districts in the capital territory made up of 11. The largest city, however, is actually Mumbai with New Delhi, Bangalore or Bengaluru and Hyderabad following after. However, the four busiest airports are Delhi Indira Gandhi International, Mumbai's Chhatrapati Shivaji International, Bengaluru's Kempe Golda International, and Chennai International in the south. Ah, uh, you know why I'm smiling. This is my favorite part of any episode we ever make. Territorial anomaly time. India is loaded with strange borders and deliciously complex demarcation lines. First of all, what exactly is a union territory? In the simplest way I can put this, union territories are places that are too distinct to be incorporated into a state but too small to have their own local governments. The first one, of course, is the Delhi National Capital Territory, where the capital lies. Chandigarh is a post-independent city constructed to replace Lahore as the capital of the Punjab area after it was split up between India and Pakistan. Then you have the island territories, the smallest one, Lakshadweep, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The Andaman Islands being home to one of the last uncontacted people groups on the planet, the Sentinelese tribe, whom have been hostile to visitors and are therefore left alone, as well as the Nicobar Islands, which actually used to be a short-lived colony of Denmark. Finally, the three remaining territories are former Europe European colony towns and ports. Dadra and Nagar Haveli, Daman and Diu, which are separated by about 200 kilometers across the Gulf of Kambat, and the most confusing Union territory, the French-speaking Puducherry, which is actually split up between four district cities across India. Karikal, Mahe, Yanaon, and Pondicherry. Pondicherry is strange because it has 11 enclaves within the Tamil Nadu state. Oh, and in this area, you can also find that experimental hippie-ish commune with a little bit of controversy. Look it up. Oh, and don't forget, here, the eastern states, also known as the Seven Sisters, are connected by this incredibly narrow 27 kilometer wide pathway known as the Siliguri Corridor. This pathway is like a crucial artery that completes the India puzzle. Or so you would think. Now let's discuss the juicy stuff. Now in the China episode, I already talked about the disputed areas with India, such as Aksai Chin and Arunachal Pradesh, the latter pretty much just belonging to India as it's almost completely inhabited and operated by Indians. So let's move to the other disputes. Now as of 2015, the Bangladesh episode is already outdated as India and Bangladesh have finally come to an agreement over the frighteningly complex former enclave-exclave dispute. In the end, India only lost about 40 square kilometers of land to Bangladesh, and now only a few enclaves and exclaves exist. Now let's head north. Now when you try to draw the shape of India, you might want to be careful which depiction you use. Some might use this picture, some might use this, some might use this, and those that don't really study very well might use this. The point is, the whole area is like the most heavily militarized, diplomatically stressed out region on the planet. It's already had like four wars in the past half century. Basically, India, Pakistan, and to some extent China all want the entire area for themselves, although it's more of like a Pakistan-India thing. In the China episode, we already discussed the Chinese disputes with India, so I won't cover those in this episode. If you want to learn more, just watch the China episode. But anyway, this entire the era was a former domain known as the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir that was under royal Maharaja rulers all the way up until independence. Currently, this place is split up by this fenced off militarized line known as the line of control between India and Pakistan. Why is this? Well, in the quickest way I can put this, okay, the British are out, we get to take your land. Uh, no, we want to be an independent princely state. Uh, we're supposed to take your land and majority of your people are Muslim, just like us, even though your ruler is Hindu as well. Hey, India? Yeah? If you help me, I'll let you secede my territory to your land with autonomy. Deal. <laughs> ha! Your problem now! I love how Mike played India. He totally represents India. Oh, and keep in mind, Pakistan's capital, Islamabad, is less than 80 kilometers away from all that drama. The line of control meanders through the mountains until it stops at a point called NJ9842. This is where things get really crazy because from there you hit the Siachen Glacier, the second longest non-polar glacier in the world, and this is pretty much the dead man zone. After point NJ9842, you hit the actual ground position line, a series of military outposts that extend all the way to the Chinese border. That means everything in this area is ground 
ground zero for the Indo-Pak tension. And you know, the crazy thing is there's actually literally small towns of normal regular civilians living in these areas high up in the mountains, many of which just go about daily life, going to work and raising their families. Otherwise, they have a river dispute with Nepal and various river islands disputed with Bangladesh. Outside of all the dispute stuff though, India not only has the world's second largest road network and three of the world's top 10 megacities and their own space program, but they also have a copious abundance of landmarks and notable sites, way too many to list, but some of the ones that you guys, the Indian geography peeps have told me to mention include places like the abandoned Danush Kodi ghost city, Golconda Fort, the four pillars of Charminar, the Ajanta Buddhist art caves, the Alora monolithic ruins, Mandu fortress, the Golden Temple, which feeds over 100,000 people a day, the Golgumbaz mausoleum, the Kalavantin Durg post, the ruins of Hampi, the hill forts of Rajasthan, Shaturunjaya Hill, which is basically like a Mecca for Jains, the temple of the Bodhi tree, Jal Mahal, Bangart Fort, the most haunted place in India, Mahabat Makbara. And keep in mind, just like in China, you can find a great wall of India in Rajsamand. There's also the Paritala Anjanea temple with the largest statue in India depicting Hanuman. And at over 150 acres, the Sri Rangan Ataswami temple, the largest Hindu temple in the world. Oh yeah, and there's also that building with the stuff and the thing, whatever. Anyway, we could go on for centuries talking about India's rich constructed domicile, but what it lies on top of is even more fascinating. <laughs> Now, don't make this mistake. I'm going to India. All I need are my sandals and sunscreen. Oh, crap. Now, as the seventh largest country in land area, India has a wide range of landscapes, climates, and elevations that all contrast from one corner to the other. First of all, let's talk about the north. India sits on the Indian tectonic plate that essentially smashed into the Eurasian plate, which in return created the largest mountain range in the world, the Himalayas. The force is so strong that it's estimated that the Himalayas grow about 2.4 inches or 6.1 centimeters every year. There's also where you can find Kanchenjunga, the tallest mountain in India, or the third in the world, right on the border of Nepal. Keep your eye on these mountains. These are pretty much the source of most of India's major rivers that give life to the whole country. That's why India takes these mountains so seriously. You can also find the largest natural lake, Wular, up in the Jammu Kashmir area. Below the Himalayas, you reach the North Indian River Plains, sometimes referred to as the Indus Ganga. This is the most fertile part of India where the most important rivers like the Ganges and its tributaries flow. Heading a little south, you reach the Satpura and Vindhya ranges that pretty much divide North India from South India. On each side, you get the West and East Ghat Mountains, which in return creates this massive triangle thing called the Deccan Plateau. This place is moderately forest, especially in the East, in the Chotra Nagpur Plateau where you get a section of the swampy Sundarbans that they share with Bangladesh. Check out the Bangladesh episode. Head a little west and you get the dry tar desert along the border with Pakistan, as well as the Ran of Kutch known as the Salt Desert. And finally, the only active volcanic area would be the Adaman and Nicobar Islands, with Barren Island having actual conical eruptions and Bharatan having tame mud volcanoes. Now here's the thing, although India has a relatively high population density, they do relatively well with maintaining their ecological footing. In fact, in 2016, they beat a world record by planting, disputably, 50 million trees in one day. They've also agreed to re forced about 12% of their country by 2030. The most heavily forested area being the seven sister states in East India. Now, one of the factors that contributes to this would be the fact that India has the lowest meat consumption in the world with the highest population percentage of vegetarians at around 40%, most of whom are lacto-vegetarians that consume milk products. By the way, in India, when buying groceries, this label means vegetarian and this one means not vegetarian. Nonetheless, the remainder of the population does typically eat some kind of animal protein, mostly in the forms of seafood or chicken, but almost never beef or pork, unless if you are part of the Muslim or Christian minority scattered throughout the west and east areas. Now, let's talk about the role of cattle, shall we? India has more cattle and livestock than anywhere else in the world at around 330 million. And it's interesting because since they have prevalent Hindu traditions, the killing of cows is illegal in many of the states except for a few, and each state has varying degrees of punishment for committing intentional cow slaughter. Keyword intentional. Cows accidentally get hit by cars all the time. Once a cow is too old to produce milk, it typically is released into the open to die naturally in the wild, ideally. Nonetheless, male cattle get it much worse as they are deemed as kind of useless. Some places use them as draft animals for labor, some religious sects use them as sacrifices, but otherwise they are typically sold to the underground market for beef or hides. To this day, there are about six times as many female cows as male cattle in India, so that means, yeah, something's happening to the males. Nonetheless, India does have the third highest carbon emission rate after China and the US, fourth if you consider the EU. However, emission per capita, they rank pretty low at only about two kilotons per person. Contrast that with Qatar at about 40. There are 94 national parks, 501 animal sanctuaries across the country where you can find some of the national animals like the peacock, the Ganges River Dolphin, the King Cobra, the Indian Elephant, and the highest population of Bengal Tigers in the world, which are all highly protected. India also has the most irrigated land in the world, which allows them to become the number one producer of multiple products like millet, bananas, lemons, limes, mangoes, ginger, chickpeas, milk, butter, fennel, jute, and about 75% of the world's spices alone come from India. Speaking of which, food! Typically you can find the staples roti, chapati, and naan in the north, idli and dosa in the south, and everybody eats rice. The more 
commonly commercialized Indian foods that we in the West grew up knowing, like samosas, tikka masala, tandoori's, and my favorite Indian dish, palak paneer. These usually come from the northern regions of India. Mm, seriously, India, you took spinach and made it fat. I love you guys. Otherwise, the West is mostly known for their chutneys and pickled foods, as well as beef, since there's a high number of Muslims and Christians. The South uses a lot more coconut and has some of the best curries, like porials, sambras, rasams, and tutus. And the East is known for having the best desserts, like peda, mishti doi, rasgula, or shondesh. Speaking of which, India is so diverse and complex that sometimes even Indian people need translators when going to different states. It's about to get 10 times more confusing in about three, two, one. Shashi Turur once said, in India, we celebrate the commonality of major differences. We are a land of belonging rather than blood. First of all, India has a population of about 1.3 billion people and is the second most populous country in the world after China with about 18% of the world's population. About 72% of the country is Indo-Aryan and a quarter are Dravidian, and the majority of the remainder are Mongoloid, Asian, and other people groups. They also use the Indian rupee as their currency, they use the Type C, D, and M plug outlets, and they drive on the left side of the road. By the way, technically it's illegal for these banknotes to leave the country, but you guys have sent me a lot of them for fan mail for Fan Friday videos, so I don't want to go to jail again. Now keep in mind, those statistics that I just mentioned are incredibly generalized. Of the Indo-Aryan and Dravidian communities, there are about 2,000 different ethno-linguistic people groups in India with about 645 district indigenous tribes, 52 major ones, so obviously we can't cover them all, but what we do know is that the North is very different from the South. For one, the North mostly speaks in languages that are all related to the Indo-Aryan branch, with languages like Hindi, Bengali, Punjabi, and Gujarati, whereas the South speaks a completely unintelligible Dravidian branch with languages like Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, and Kannada. <laughs> Canada. Otherwise, there's also pockets of Sino-Tibetan and Austro-Asiatic languages spoken in the far north and east. Wait, so how do they all, like, communicate with each other? Great question! Although India does not have an official language, there are 22 recognized national languages, and of these, two are the most prevalent, taught in schools and used by government officials, Hindi and English. And very often, these two are, like, mixed mid-sentence. It's weird. Don't be surprised if you hear someone speaking Hindi and then suddenly finishing off in English. It's like, It's like, And I was like, And I was like, trying to, like, why are you even trying to do that? I know, right? And the washing machine, I told them, but I said, give a Bob Saget with a chainsaw. Now, of course, let's discuss the one thing that goes hand in hand with India, Hinduism. About 80% of India claims to be Hindu, or at least part of the Hindu practicing community. Now, we don't have time to explain everything about the tenets and multi-layered philosophies and practices of Hinduism. If you want to know, just talk to a Hindu person. But basically, one thing you do need to know is that Hindu-driven ideologies pretty much dominate most of life in India, everything from family to business. You will see colorful, mesmerizing shrines, temples, statues, and rituals being performed everywhere, even in public. On oh, the Bharat Mata, the mother of India, statues are everywhere. She's like the symbol of India. The largest Hindu pilgrimage, the Kumela, happens every three years, rotating between four cities in which the adherents bathe in the Ganges River and enjoy a massive festival with tens of millions of people. Like, seriously, you can practically see it happening from space. Now, a controversial topic in relation to Hinduism would be the caste system, which is basically a belief that people are born into a socioeconomic life that they are destined to serve into. Today, however, the system is more fluid and loose from what it used to be from a long time ago. And thanks to economic reforms, anybody with enough drive can kind of move up the social ladder regardless of birth. Nonetheless, India is home to every major religion in the world, even a few Jews, including the Benai Menashe, an indigenous group that claimed to be one of the lost tribes of Israel. In fact, Judaism and Christianity actually had a head start in India way before it even kicked off in Europe. As tradition holds, Cochin, or Malabar Jews, migrated around 1000 BC to trade during the times of King Solomon, and in 53 AD, Thomas, the apostle of Jesus, arrived in what is now the state of Kerala to establish the first church in India. Today, most Christians are found in the southwest and far east Seven Sisters regions. India also holds the highest population of Sikhs, Jains, and Zoroastrians, mostly found in the north, and the second largest Muslim population in the world after Indonesia. Most Muslims are populated around the northwest areas by Pakistan or in the east by Bangladesh. Oh, and don't forget the Buddhists. In fact, Buddhism actually started in India. Today, the Dalai Lama even takes refuge in Tespur in the state of Assam. Oh, that was a lot of information. Ah! Okay, so by now you can probably get a grasp of how incredibly mixed and diversified India's population is, but what exactly holds the country together? Well, for one, you kind of have to understand Indian history, which will take way too long to explain, but in the quickest way I can put it, Indus Valley, Maurya and Gupta empires, Southern empires, Golden Age, Middle Kingdoms, a ton of new religions come flocking in, the North fell to the Delhi Sultanate, the South became the Vijaya Nagara Empire, the Mughal Empire starts, British East India Company, direct British rule, nationalist movements, independence, republic, economic liberalization in 1991, and here we are today. <laughs> Vijaya.
Essentially, India used to be made up of around 500 smaller royal princely states, and when the British came in, they kind of exploited them to manage such a huge population. Although India is a democratic federal republic and the largest democracy in the world, the old royal families still exist today, and although they have no political power, they hold high positions of influence in their communities across India. So today, technically, you could meet someone that would be considered an Indian prince or princess. Nonetheless, the biggest thing that really united Indians in the past two centuries would probably be their hatred of British rule. It was kind of like, well, this is not cool. Yep. What do you say you and I work together in a, end this thing? Essentially, one good thing you could say that came out of imperialism was that it kind of stopped all the internal squabbling and unified the groups towards one common goal, to get rid of imperialism. Today, Indians are just proud to be Indian. I mean, a Tamil soccer player can get cheered on by a Rajasthani. A Punjabi pop star can sell out tickets in Orissa. Speaking of which, all Indians love movies and music. India has the second largest film industry in terms of volume, pumping out nearly 2,000 films per year. Surprisingly, Nigeria pumps out more. However, the box office revenues gross out at only about $2 billion annually compared to Hollywood at over 10 billion, but still, it's impressive. And keep in mind, it's not just Bollywood, but it's also Tollywood, Gollywood, Kaliwood, Pollywood, and so on. There's like 20 different woods in India. Oh, and like every movie in India has at least one scene where everybody breaks out in song, and there's almost always a happy ending. Unfortunately, mainstream media has also put an aesthetic strain on many of the people, as it's almost become an obsession to be light or fair-skinned, causing people to go so far as to buy skin-bleaching products. Some other controversies include things like illiteracy being an issue in many parts of the country, especially in the rural areas, but I mean, come on, when your country has literally hundreds of different different writing systems? Go figure, I mean, give them a break. Also, many of you guys, the Indian geography peeps, have asked me to bring awareness to the fact that India does unfortunately have some of the highest rates of human trafficking and child slavery. The government is trying to crack down and culture is slowly being reformed, but for now, it's a sad reality that still does exist. Hey, here at GN, we talk about the good and the bad, I'm just saying. Otherwise, sports do definitely tie everyone together as well, especially cricket, the national sport, even though they also used to do really well in field hockey. India also has a lot of their own indigenous sports like Dopkel in Assam, bull racing in Kerala, in Suknar, Rod, pushing in Mizoram, and Malakamba, the strange pole yoga gymnastics thing in the south. Otherwise, some notable people from India or of Indian descent might include people like Siddhartha Gautama or the Buddha, Mahavir, Ashoka the Great, Prithviraj Chauhan, Aurangzeb, Shivaji of the Maratha Empire, Mohandas or Mahatma Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, Subhash Chandra Bose, Jawahar Lal Nehru, Rabindranath Tagore, C.V. Raman, Satyendra Nath Bose, Bhagat Singh, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam, Shah Rukh Khan, Amitabh Bachchan, Amir Khan, Sal Salman Khan, Priyana Chopra, Ben Kingsley, Sundar Pichai, Satya Narayana Nadella, A.R. Rahman, Sachin Tendulkar, and Mahendra Singh Dhoni. There's also literally millions of other famous people I missed out on. If you want to mention them, please, there's a comment section below. Use it. In the meantime, we got to finish this info marathon, shall we? Now, no surprise, India is huge and therefore has a huge international outreach when it comes to diplomacy to almost everyone except their immediate neighbors. First of all, countries with large population percentages of Hindus and Indians like Fiji, Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, Mauritius and Malaysia typically stay close to India's roster of go-to friends. They enjoy cordial relations with trade. Now the UK may have left on a sour note, but they still have a lot of ties to their former colonizer in terms of business and tourism. India is still part of the Commonwealth, not Commonwealth realm, there's a difference, and the UK has over 1.5 million citizens of Indian descent. As mentioned in the China episode, China is kind of like India's I'm only here to do business with you and nothing else friend as drama still hasn't subsided in regards to the territory conflicts. Now, when it comes to the U.S., things started kind of sour back in the 70s during the Indo-Pak War of 1971, when the U.S. sided with Pakistan, their arch nemesis. Today, relations have cooled off. Mostly, the U.S. supports India's move towards democracy and is a key ally in the military conflicts in the Middle East. When it comes to their best friends, however, most of the Indians I talked to have said Russia and Bhutan. Russia because during the Indo-Pak Wars, Russia came in and supported them, and ever since then, each country has held a high position of respect for the other, especially as global superpowers. Bhutan and India signed a treaty of friendship almost immediately after independence. The two countries have shared interests and a currency pegged system as well. Bhutan even supported the annexation of their cousins in the Sikkim state into India as it gave a nice buffer of land from China's stake to their claim. In conclusion, you will not find anywhere else on earth like India. Thousands and millions of people inhabiting a colorful, majestic, green, slightly gritty at times slab of earth, blessed and cursed in so many ways, yet wonderfully harmonized, mostly in a unity unlike anywhere else. In the end, that's India. Ah! Stay tuned, Indonesia is coming up next.